So we struggled over the, over the title, not the topic, but the title of my talk here, you know, because sort of, what's nuclear power got to do with it? You know? Kind of depends on how you scale peace, you know, what does it encompass? And um, for those of us that worked on the, on the nuclear issue, and also participated in some peace things. It really is a matter of peace being extended to the environment. Being at peace with our planet Earth. Fellow describing cluster bombs over there being dropped on Laos, you know. Um, that's a human disaster, it's also an environmental disaster. Same with Agent Orange and all the rest of it. it, it nothing produces more environmental harm than war. Nuclear power <clears throat> is really an extension of our war-making machine, our war-making capabilities. In order to get a bomb, a nuclear bomb to go off, uh, one had to concentrate naturally occurring uranium from something like in a really hot load of uranium ore, maybe 0.1% maybe 0.01%, minuscule amount of fissile uranium in, a, in an ore body. And <clears throat> how to do it was, was the big puzzle. In order to separate lighter uranium atoms, from heavier uranium atoms, which is what uranium enrichment is all about. Um, they had to dissolve it in uh, acid and uh, <clears throat> fluorine and chlorine solutions and reduce the uranium chemically uh, to uranium hexafluoride a gas, a gas, and if you just picture how diffuse gas particles are, then you get an idea that if you let them set long enough, the heavier gas particles would settle toward the bottom of your container. Um, what they did in the, in the war years was to compress that uranium uh, hexafluoride gas. What they did in the war years was to run great compressors and miles of tubing and reduce the gas to tiny, tiny, thin streams, jets of gas coming out of very tiny orifices, or orify. The heavier gas projected through to other orifices in front of those that it was exiting. And the heavier gas fell to lower orifices, lower openings. The lighter gas projected more straight ahead. And by cycling the gas, tens of thousands of times through tens of thousands of orifices they were able to separate the lighter fissile form of uranium uranium 235 it was called from the heavier non-fissile U238 it was not a perfect separation much of it 
um, was separated down to about 3% U-235 fissile uranium and 97% um, non-fissile uranium-238. That was strong enough a mix to put in a, put in a um, reactor together with water to slow exiting neutrons down from the 235, have them collide with others and produce a chain reaction. Those first reactors were built at Hanford, Washington. There were a number of them. Some of the designs, by the way, were identical um, to the Russian reactor that blew up in 1996, the Chernobyl reactor. Um, and because that also, just like the Hanford ones, was designed to do one thing, and that was to convert the U-235 and the also heavier U-238 to plutonium-239. And the U.S. bomb program went on two tracks. One was to continue enriching the uranium until they got up to about 97% pure, 235. And the other was to shift that early enriched fuel to reactors to produce plutonium. And so the, the U.S. program, they kind of uh, doubled down, they backed their bet by making a uranium bomb and a plutonium bomb. And when the uranium bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, the U.S. had stockpiled just enough uranium almost for one more bomb. It was really, it was really all they could do to get that together. The second bomb dropped on uh, Nagasaki was a plutonium bomb. There's two that we had. And it's been, you know, cynically people call it an experiment. But it was an experiment out of exigency. I mean, this is all that the U.S. had in its, in its arsenal. And um, so we're left with Hanford Reservation, which was thousands and thousands of desert acres in Washington State, with dozens of reactors, dozens, designed primarily to produce plutonium. The fuel, when it was burned in those reactors, was then drowned in nitric acid, um, tens of thousands of gallons, hundreds of thousands of gallons of nitric acid. The solution was then chemically washed to get the plutonium out. All the rest of it the various isotopes of uranium, of, of um, oddball uh, transuranics like Neptunium and so on, all of the what are called fission products, which are the really close-up deadly uh, radioactive products, cesium, strontium, cobalt, all the rest of that, um, were left in solution, in the acid solution. These were stored in metal tanks, by and large, unlined steel tanks in the desert on the shores of the Columbia River. And that cleanup is still underway. And mega billions of dollars later. Um, the Russians, I think, set off their first atomic bomb in 1957. I'm not dead certain on that, I think 57. But in the late 50s, um, 10 years after the war, 
Um, they had captured uh, enough in the way of scientists and enough information from the U.S. program to build their own bomb. And so the bomb development program was accelerated. You got to build more and better bombs than the Russians. And so the reactors at Hanford were going round the clock, producing ever more waste. And there was a public outcry because the nuclear weapons testing was poisoning mother's milk uh, from Alaska to Maryland. Um, no doubt about it. And uh, a lot of public advocates, including peace advocates, um, raised hell about it. So the genesis of that um, was the Atoms for Peace program under Eisenhower. And that takes us right to Maine because uh, the first reactor built under the Atoms for Peace program went online in 1962 and it was Yankee Row over in uh, western Massachusetts. Um, the Atomic Energy Commission came to New England because New England didn't have much in the way of uh, native power sources. Hydro, but we had no coal, no oil, none of that. And uh, So they came to sell the idea of nuclear plants in New England. No one utility was big enough to cough up the money to sponsor a nuclear plant. And uh, so they formed consortia. In Maine Yankee was owned by 10 different utilities. So, so, <clears throat> yeah, Maine Yankee was owned 51% by Maine utilities, including CMP at 37 or 38%, something like that. And uh, the first advanced teams for the Atomic Energy Commission came to Wiscasset, Maine, in 1966, 65, 66, scouting a cold water location um, because a nuke plant, like any steam plant, needs a lot of cold water to condense the steam so that they can have a cycle produce power. And uh, my wife and I and the, a few of our, the beginnings of our family, our first two children, uh, moved to, uh, first three, moved to Wiscasset in 1967. So we were, we were there for the construction of this thing. Uh, we were promised, as you know, the area was promised, a spurt of economic development uh, brought on by uh, inexpensive electricity. The uh, waste fuel was to be packaged after three years of, uh, uh, after three years removed from the reactor when it cooled down a little bit, it was to be shipped to West Valley, New York to be reprocessed um, so that the uh, energetic components of the fuel could be extracted and reused in, in reactors. Um, you should know that what we call spent fuel is not spent. It's, it's a really a misnomer. Um, it's really poisoned fuel. When the fuel fissions, those fission products, the very intense radioactive materials that are broken out of the heavier uranium atoms, um, cobalt, cesium, strontium-90, iodine, all those, all those tritium, name it, all of those radioactive materials um, clog the fuel, they tend to interrupt the flow of neutrons. 
And so the more radioactive the fuel becomes, the less effective it is. So, for example, typically our fuel at Maine Yankee was 3% uranium. That's the enrichment level. 3% uh, uranium-235, 97% 238 non-fissile material. After it is irradiated in the reactor, after about 18 months, it is more and more difficult to sustain that chain reaction because it's being clogged with radioactive, intensely radioactive material, becoming hotter, if you will, both temperature-wise and radiation-wise. So you get to the end of it. At that point, you have about 1.5% uh, fissile uranium, another 1.4 or so percent fissile plutonium, and some transuranics. So in terms of, in terms of fissile material, in terms of material that you can have a fission reaction going on with, it's back up to where it was when you first put it in, except that you have all these intensely radioactive fission products that are clogging the, spa the inter-atomic spaces, if you will. That's what we call spent fuel. The idea being, oh, it's all used up and so the energy's all gone. Well, no. Uh, if you can get rid of all of the um, intensely radioactive materials, you can put it back in a reactor and run it. The only problem is that it takes an intense amount of chemical and mechanical action to separate those materials out. It takes to for, for that one fuel load, one 18-month fuel load, it takes several thousand gallons of nitric acid to dissolve that material. They chop it up, remote control, and they dump it in the nitric acid bath, and they dissolve it, and then they begin chemical separation to, to flush out the different elements. All of that becomes radioactive waste. In what year? 1970 or something like that. Um, 1974, maybe. Jimmy Carter <clears throat> ordered a, a secession to reprocess, reprocessing in the United States. We had two commercial reprocessing outfits at the time. Um, West Valley, New York, and Morris, Illinois were the two locations. Both of them were environmental and worker safety disasters. At Morris, Illinois, when the assembly line broke down somewhere out in the plant, and it's all in shielded tunnels where this fuel was being handled. When the assembly line broke down, quite often what they would do is simply wall it off and build a new line alongside of it because no, no living creature could go in there for more than a little bit. In some areas, when they had mechanical malfunctions with the, this intensely radioactive equipment, they called in workers from Manpower Incorporated over in Albany, and they paid them a week's wage to run into a room with a wrench and turn a nut or a bolt three or four turns and then run the hell out where they had accumulated their annual radiation dose in a matter of seconds. Um, I think Nader was, they called it the most cynical use of human labor since the building of the pyramids. Um, but these are poor people that you know, needed a day job. 
and they cranked them through by the tens of thousands. Um, even at that, West Valley and the Morris, Illinois plant were both failing economically. They were going under. So, although what Jimmy Carter did was a good thing, it also served to bail them out. They could then go to their creditors and say, I'm sorry, force majeure, nothing we can do about it, the government shut us down. So, we can't pay it. And, um, and that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> Ronald Reagan, in 1984, opened the spigot again. He said, sure, fine, go ahead and reprocess. But guess what? No one did. Only, only the military reactors for weapons. About <clears throat> two months ago, uh, Ernest Moniz, the former Secretary of Energy, uh, put out a statement and said it was a, a matter of national defense, a national defense priority to keep our nuclear plants running, subsidize them, get more running, because the uh, technical personnel resources to support the U.S. nuclear navy and the nuclear weapons program um, were being shortchanged because universities were no longer training nuclear engineers and physicists and so on, um, and they really needed the nuclear power program to sustain us. All right. Let's put it back together. So let, let's just go right to today. Um, yeah, he's a um, nuclear engineering professor uh, at MIT, um, and quite a personable fellow too. And and one of the problems they had at uh, West Valley, New York, was that they they were mixing in uh, military fuel with the civilian fuel. And they had contracts, all of their contracts, I think, were back to the military with whatever they produced. So there, there wasn't even a civilian market for it at the time. And by the way, how much nuclear fuel was shipped from Main Yankee to be reprocessed? Zero. Nada. So every except for a couple of elements that were sent uh, to Vallecitos, California, to the GE labs uh, for testing. No, no, a couple of pieces of fuel, um, a really minor amount. Uh, all that was ever created at Main Yankee in its 24 years of operation is still sitting there. Uh, well, it yeah, there it is. Oh, that's the plant itself. Um, yeah. Well, let me go right this. Let's see. That's the fuel in the uh, spent fuel pool, and the the water is glowing bright green. That's the oxygen in the water that's being excited by the radiation causes that glow. Um, all the fuel that was ever created there is being stored uh, in casks. It's about, uh, what we have here, 542 metric tons. Metric ton is a thousand kilograms or about 2.2 real people tons. Um, okay. And it is stored in 64 canisters, which are stainless steel. They're maybe 12 to 14 feet long. They're about a yard wide. Um, stainless steel is about five inch, eight inches thick, except on the ends where it's much heavier. 
Um, and those canisters are lowered into concrete casks. The concrete cask has a two inch or two and a half inch steel liner and then about 28 inches of highly reinforced super duper concrete around that. There's a space between the canister and the cask, space about this much. And at the, at the bottom of the cask and at the top, there are vent holes. They have some uh, uh, expanded metal mesh stapled on this to prevent critters from getting in there or terrorists. And um, so what happens is the, the canisters give off heat. Fresh canister of fuel is about 24,000 watts or about the size of a small trailer furnace or, or maybe uh, 240, 100 watt light bulbs all going at once. That's the heat it, it puts out. And that heat causes the air in that space to rise and draw in more air in the bottom. And so there's a airflow that goes up to cool the outside of the stainless steel canister. Um, the canister itself sits on a very low pedestal in the bottom of this concrete uh, cask. So, when Main Yankee was building that, we had a lot of issues with the company. We were working with the company. We had intervened, at, and they agreed to come to settlement with us. We insisted that they build a earthen berm around the facility to protect it from direct line, uh, line of sight projectiles. Um, to protect it from sight from the river, which is right next to it. And they did it around three sides. The, the fourth side is partially obscured by an administration building that is attached to this waste site. Let me see if I can get to a picture of it. Uh, they're pouring concrete. There's the concrete canisters. Those things are 11 feet in diameter and about 20 feet high. There's the site, and you really cannot make out, unfortunately, from this distance, the, the um, berms built around it. But <clears throat> the company agreed, and they, they went part way. They didn't build them as high as the very top of the cask because of the geometry of it would cause the bottom to be too big too much material, but they went up two-thirds the way, so that much is shielded. Um, the other thing is that uh, the plans were to put all of these casks on a single great big um, concrete pad, three foot thick monster pad, 64 casks on it, and um, we convinced them to uh, do a modular arrangement so there instead of one big um, platform there are 16 of them and there is room in between to bring in emergency vehicles um, hand uh, cask handling equipment whatever they may need should one of those casks ever spring a leak or get a hole shot in it uh, and uh, so we were able to convince them to do that. Um, pardon me? I don't think so. Uh, it's not to say that it couldn't happen. Um, because stainless steel, any householder knows, you know, that your stainless steel pans and pots and pans just don't really hold up as well as they might. Uh, stainless steel does not like being heated and chilled, and it tends to be to begin to crack. 
stress, what they call stress corrosion cracking. At Maine Yankee, um, <laughs> one thing that we managed when, this, what a story it is, you know. When Central Maine Power was sold to Iberdrola, our little group on the Friends of the Coast intervened on the basis that we want, wanted Iberdrola to really pay attention to the fact that CMP owned 37 percent of this waste and we needed to have some real focus there. Um, as part of a settlement agreement with that intervention before the main PUC, we got Iberdrola to agree to sustain funding for the state inspector and his office until the fuel is removed plus, I forget whether it's five or ten years. So, so we have for an iron rice bowl, as they call it, for our state inspector. I mean, he's there, he's good, um, but he's on site. And he recently did report that some of the concrete in these casks has begun to spall and flake. And some of the, um, as a result then, some of the reinforcement bar in there is beginning to corrode. It only makes sense. So we have that. And Main Yankee um, just did a robotic uh, inspection cameras up inside that plenum and around the um, canisters. They didn't say exactly what the condition was, whether there might be any incipient cracking, but they said there was nothing, no surprises. Uh, seem to be all intact. So that's what we know. We don't know, what we don't know is how long that's going to be there. NRC, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, licensed these casks for 20 years only. And we're getting there. But they've also, with, at other locations, simply renew the licenses, it's just a matter of formality. And in public um, engagements, they have pretty much across the board, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has said, these casts are good for 100 years at least, or maybe 120, but we'll just keep constantly checking on them. So there is no date for removal of those casts. The Trump administration has yet to restart um, the Yucca Mountain project. It's very unlikely that they will. There's just not a national will for it. Uh, and some private corporations have sold Texas and New Mexico on the idea of accepting all of this waste for what they call interim storage from now until we get ready to put it in the ground. And uh, New Mexico has laid out a thousand acre site. They, they are looking for a thousand acres of pads on which to bring and store the nation's waste. And they'll, they will make money on that. I forget how many dollars it is. Uh, $15 per kilogram is the storage site, so um, per year. Yeah, <clears throat> so there's money to be made there. That's what we're left with. Um, my last um, slide up there is a definition of hubris. Um, Hubris is, if anything, is a, an opposite, an antidote to peacemaking. It is hubris. Um, modern definition is overweening pride. In the ancient Greek definition, it was overweening pride coupled with violence.
a willingness to be violent. I think, the, for me, the casks, plugging them in on the coast of Maine, um, sums up that hubris pretty well. So that's what we're left with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and this is um, this is a reversal, of course. You know, I mean, back when we had sane, reasonable presidents like George W. and Reagan, and you know, the the uh, agreements were made with the Russians. Hey, let's take the plutonium out of the weapons, mix it with uranium, and burn it in U.S. reactors. Let's 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 uh, transform the weapons program into uh, a power commercial program, and uh, that's all gone by the boards. That is that's no, not happening. Um, and, you know, I think there's more money to be made in weapons than there is in turning people's light bulbs on. Where there's plenty of money, and CMP can tell you that, but, but um, no. The, some months ago, I was with a little group that, on a vis, peace vigil at BIW. Bruce Gagnon was there. And a lot of the people were carrying signs about converting BIW to build windmills or build, uh, uh, you know, light rail, rapid transit, you know, and whatever. Anything, anything except, you know, warships. And one of the guys coming out, one of the workers said, yeah, you know, some wages we'll make building that shit. You know, we're, we're getting paid real good to build these weapons of destruction. And I, and I think that's, you know, it's not unusual. It's kind of the common stuff. Yeah. Measurable? Yeah. <laughs> Measurable, yes, but, but then, then what what the regulations allow uh, people to be exposed to is quite a bit higher than what's coming out. Um, but our state guy is there, and he's there on a periodic basis with his uh, equipment to m me measure and monitor the radiation. Um, it wouldn't be the result of material coming out it's a result of the direct radiation shine, including, including a, a certain amount of neutron shine from the top of these casts. Yes, I, I should mention too, in terms of, you gonna give it up? Oh. In terms, of, in terms of impacts on the cast, yeah. So, in terms of impact on the, of the cast, so I came across a company out. This this uh, waste site is in the middle of a reserve. You can't get in, so you can't get within a hundred yards of it. There's, there's, there's no equipment, I think, that we could all afford together even that would, me that would, me that would measure that, that would see it, you know. But I, I did want to mention in terms of environmental impact, a colleague of mine, a friend and colleague, you know, we, we gossip, nuclear gossip, you know, it's like, okay, you get together, it's like, how oh, did you hear? And she was telling me that in Germany, where they have their their casks are not stainless steel and then concrete. 
their casts are cast iron, one piece, and it's it's all wavy like on the outside. It's got these rings sort of cast into it, but it's thick cast iron, 12 inches thick more or less, and uh, with a bolt-on lid. And they had the choice in Germany, the in industry, of whether to do canisters like we're using or have these cast iron casts. And they, they were leery of using the canister that we use, cask and canister, because they, th they theorized that airborne microbes would be drawn into that plenum, go up through this irradiation chamber, and be cast out the top 24-7 for the next bazillion years. And that you could not help but to mutate these various microbes, and you didn't know what the hell you were going to produce. I asked the main Yankee guys about that, and they said, nah. Those radiation fields are so damn intense, anything going through there would be fried. <laughs> so, so, no, you know. Except the cockroach. But, but um, hmm. you know. What were the issues that led to Main Yankee being shut down? Um, they could not afford to continue to meet the regulatory standards. They just, they had, they had, well, what they did as in the late 1980s, they found that they weren't making enough money. They were barely covering their debt. And uh, so <clears throat> at that time, this was the situation across the United States. And the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission encouraged these plants to try to increase the volume of steam they were putting through their reactor, increase the um, amount of heat that the fuel was producing, and therefore increase power. They called power up rates. Main Yankee did one in 1991 or two. They did a 10% power boost. And your body. So if anybody is the problem is in joining, we're starting that where right now, the heat right here, uh, from the can, reactor uh, I'll give us a minute is, is transferred with a reading and to a reading the, of the bell. water and, and steam that goes through the turbine, the the those heat exchangers. Just gonna be walking around the they didn't, they of couldn't this change area. their capacity. But again, that's not what we're really and doing. And the really stresses resulted in, in the very fracturing a lot of those interfaces. Which is the beginning there's, of peace. Uh, in, the, in these units, which are called steam generators, there's um, about 30,000 uh, 24 foot tall loops of thin tubing that, if it's a big radiator, that, that heats the turbine water to steam. The reactor itself is under intense pressure. So the water that's in the reactor cannot turn to steam unless you get a break. That water is under 2,000 pounds of pressure. And so it's, it's water, but it's at 500 degrees more or less. Okay, this is almost the time. Again, anyway, that like steam generator is the, the pinch point for the power up rate. They wound up destroying no risk their steam generators at Main Yankee. Lots they tried clean. putting new tubes in, sleeving the tubes, welding them, laser and welding. They tried the everything, and to no avail. They just dumped tens world. of millions of dollars into it. Um, and at the time, the state of Maine said, hey, would you like to borrow some money? We'll help you buy a new steam generator. Maine Yankee said, yeah, probably not, because that was not the only equipment that was beginning to fail. And um, there's documents where they told their employees 
start walking. Do not report everything that is failing, wrong, or broken. Only the stuff that's important to, to safety to because we're not going to fix step. everything. In End of story. We don't have the money to fix it. So I'm going to read two things. And so, this is in the manner of Buddhism. Yeah, that, um, it was an economic was business Luther decision for the, to shut uh, the plant down. Nobel Peace Prize but it was driven by an inability to meet sides, the safety standards. To bring peace towards the, in the Vietnam War. And that's what did them in. That is what did in. Begins with you. The NRC all. had nothing to For do with that. Pardon me? NRC nations, didn't have anything to do with No, no. NRC has never, would never dream of shutting down a plant. They get panicky if you mention the it. The mind no, can no. go um, in a thousand directions. No, the, the, the NRC, path, well, I walk in peace. Right. We asked with each step, uh, a gentle wind Governor blows. King to order step, a safety inspection a of the plant will bloom. when these issues started coming up. Yeah. And at some point, uh, things were going bad. He had a meeting here at Bowdoin College with the, with the uh, main Yankee management. He came away from the meeting. He called the NRC and asked them to do a safety inspection to show Maine people that it's safe. Um, NRC refused. He said, I will do it in that case. And they said, oh, no, you won't. Wait, give us 24 hours. They came back. They sent an uh, inspection team of 20-some guys up here for four weeks. The inspection team went back to D.C. and said, you know, we really couldn't find anything much. The chairman of the NRC said, we're not paying you not to find stuff. Go back and find some shit, you know. So they did. And, and that was like uh, totally unfixable stuff. The huge concrete containment was built undersized. They, they miscalculated the volume of the containment during an accident. So it, it yeah. Um, and, and, hey. Hey. One of one of the problems that they were avoiding dealing with <clears throat> was something that an NRC inspector found, but then NRC wouldn't pay attention to, and that was that they did not have a good, accurate wiring schematic for the plant. They didn't know which wire went where. <laughs> okay, so this is in, in nuclear plants. We have to keep pumps running and. Have uh, you know monitor stuff and you know, this is big deal, and um, so so at some point after this big inspection, and by the way they found the inspection found like 3,300 maintenance items in arrears, 300 of those were safety related. I mean it's just all kinds of stuff stacked up, but then they said but the plant's safe to run. I was like you guys go ahead. However, they had shut down to fix something, and at that point, um, we had been on NRC's case about the wiring. NRC said, stay shut down until you get the wiring fixed. That was in the end of 1996. In the spring of, like, January, February of 97, they had an engineering firm come in and try to go over the wiring and they, they, they gave up. They, they were there for like a week. They, they made 3,800 different labels and tags to put on different cables and cable trays and try to figure out whatever was what. Couldn't do it. And that, that wiring issue was the big ticket item that finally sank them. They, they did everything. They tried to wiggle out of it in every which way. They being Yankee. Main Yankee. Main Yankee, yeah. They had, they had, um, there are these um, concrete vaults, small, con heavy reinforced concrete rooms where there are cable connections. Cables come through. They, 
they come in conduits from this direction, that direction, whatever, and they feed into these rooms. The rooms are so filled with cables, you can't really get in there. But there are the connections are in there. And I was at the meeting in Pennsylvania where Maine Yankee suggested to NRC that what they would like to do is put circuit breakers on all the cables going in and all the cables coming out of these rooms. And uh, NRC didn't buy it, you know. It, what, what an inspector told us is when you are under accident conditions, you want to turn certain pumps on and leave them on until they burn out. You don't want to have some damn circuit breaker tripping on you. So, anyway, that was... NRC, in a, in a way, they played a role. But that, that wiring issue was, was raised by an NRC inspector, fire inspector, in 1978. And Maine Yankee just kept issuing different proposals. You know, we'll take care of it next week. We're going to do this. We're gonna... They did nothing until 96. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Henry, Henry Myers was a uh, physicist by training, and he was a congressional aide, and he was retired up here to Maine. And the last time I saw Henry, he was, he was older than you, I think. He was, he was really old. He was 90 something, you're 90 something. And, and we were, we were doing a demonstration on the bridge in Damariscotta, and it was blowing sleet and rain. And this hooded, gray figure came up sidling up both sides and said, ah, how are you doing, Ray? There was Henry out there. What were we picketing? I don't know what the hell it was. It must have been uh, Gulf War One or something. Yeah. Yeah, Henry Meyer. Yeah. All around good guy. 79. He died at 79. Did he? He was 79 years old when he died. No, he was he was a little much older than that. <laughs> Maybe a different man. Yeah. No, the same time, you know, I don't think so. I thought he was way older. Anyway. Yeah. There, can we undo this now? Yeah. Okay. We have to. Oh, you want it back on? Yeah. Did anyone ask about the water, rising water? What, sea level rise? Yeah, that's a big spot. If sea level rises, about 15 feet, I will have shorefront property. <laughs> but I will be about 130 by then. The question is how high above mean high water are those container vessels? They're about, I'm guessing, I just would guess from just visually about 20 some feet above the high water mark. I don't know where where all those particular organizations went. We had a local group that wrestled with Maine Yankee in its final throes and and undertook to monitor this waste thing. But um, just two years ago, um, Representative Brackey, Senator Brackey from over in oh Lewiston. But he proposed legislation backed by Governor LePage to undertake thorium mining and state permitting for thorium processing for what's, what's called the thorium nuclear cycle. It's a, a thorium is radioactive uh, material much like uranium and it's a energy source that was considered 
in the early days, even uh, even for weapons, uh, but then was discarded because uranium was easier to deal with. And um, some salesmen came through, and they they were advertising a a metal cooled reactor that couldn't possibly melt down because. It had a molten core to start with and didn't need water and et cetera, et cetera. And it was a wonderful thing and it would actually eat nuclear waste. And, and um, so I attended um, the hearings on it. And the, the uh, energy committee of the legislature just said, in the end of the arguments, they just said, it's all too complicated. We're not going to put the bill forward. You know, but the effort was made. It's, a lot of it is coming out of MIT, where there's a nuclear brain trust of sorts, and they have a lot of young people with a zillion different innovative designs, and they want to do it all over again. Here in Maine. Here in well, this was in Maine, yeah. Right, no, but they want to bring this. They want to re reintroduce the bill again. Yeah. Oh, they re I don't know about that. That particular piece of legislation was gone, but its sponsor is, is now, uh, what's he running for? U.S. US representative. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. I hope that you got some information out of all that. And I plan, 